What is good guys, it is Reed, and welcome back to another video. Today we got a very special video, something a little bit different. Um, it does involve cards, but not specifically. Uh, I'm gonna be going over a very powerful tool called Equivoque. Now Equivoque is a technique that can be used to verbally force objects. So you don't need anything, you can just have the person essentially say what you want them to say in a sense. It's very, very powerful, especially when used with cards, but it doesn't have to be used with cards. It can be used with anything. In this video, I'm gonna to try to go over everything I know. I'm gonna go over how to use it, when to use it, um, what to use it with, what not to use it with, and then I'm gonna to try to teach you guys how to create your own sort of equivocate questions that you, got, you can kind of take and form to the routines that you're working on or the objects that you have, because it's not quite so easy to create a logical equivocate plot. Uh, you need to keep some things in mind when you're doing that. Now, if you're not into magic, thank you for being here. I'm not sure why you are, but this video might be something that you could find pretty interesting. Equivocate is something that theoretically you could use in your everyday life to kind of get people to say what you want them to say in a sense. And it is really something that existed outside of magic that we took in and realized it can be used very effectively in magic. So without further ado, let's jump into the Equivoque video. So before we jump too far into this video, we got to start off with something super important. How do you pronounce? Now, I've been calling it Equivoque. I have always called it Equivoque. Um, there's another video on my channel where you'll notice that I called it Equivoque, and that's because I had just watched another video where someone else was calling it Equivoque, so I decided to call it Equivoque in that video. There's about three different ways that people say this word. If you ask Siri how to say it, she'll say Equivoque. I think Equivoque sounds a lot better. Um, I'm pretty sure Equivoque is technically the way to say it, but it doesn't really matter, so I'm gonna call it Equivoque as a lot of other people do because I think it just sounds better. So what is it and how does it work? Well, essentially, Equivoque by definition is a question that can be interpreted in multiple different ways, or in other words, a question that the answer can have multiple meanings. In magic, we can use this technique to ask a question and depending on the answer, we can totally change where we're going with something or sort of change the question afterwards. But it's so logical and we make it so logical that it doesn't raise any suspicion. You can also think of these as open-ended questions. So we'll ask a question that seems like if you say this, this will happen. If you say this, this will happen. But really it's a lot more open-ended than that. And whatever you say, we can steer it to either direction just by what we respond. It's essentially devising a question with multiple meanings depending on your answer. Now this is a forcing technique, but it is a surefire forcing technique. And that means that it will work 100% of the time. There's no question that every time you try to force whatever object you're trying to force, it will work. And that's just the nature of equivocate. So why does this work? Why does something that when I'm explaining it might not seem like it makes a lot of sense, why does it fly by people and why do magicians use it all the time? Well, it works because of the logical conclusions that are drawn. Think of it this way. We have a question, we have an answer, and we have a rebuttal. A logical question is followed by a logical answer. And from both of those, we form a logical rebuttal or conclusion. And in a normal person's mind, Logical, logical, logical. There's nothing suspicious there. There's nothing funny and it makes perfect sense. So that is the biggest sort of uh, key element when you're creating equivoque questions. You need to make sure that whatever answer is given, you have a logical explanation that flows and matches the question as well as the answer. These questions also need to feel inconspicuous. They need to feel um, not that important. Okay, you need to just make it feel like, okay, whatever whatever you say, we'll go with. You know, that's, that is what it is. And, and that's really how you make this technique very powerful. So when to use Equivoque. So Equivoque is best used for 50-50 selections. So you say you pick the reds or the blues. You pick this card or that card. You pick this shoe or that shoe, okay? That's when it's best used. But don't think that this means you can only force two objects, okay? You can force so many objects and you do this by layering the equivoque. Think about it like this. If we have multiple objects, we can divide them into groups of two and then ask the equivoque on the groups. Whichever group we want, we keep. And then we divide that into two groups and we can keep narrowing it down each time being a 50-50. 
Now this is a layering equivocate, so you can really force as many objects as you want. But the problem is this is one of those techniques that you can only do so many times in a row. After a, a couple of times, it will start to fall apart and you can only make it so, so well constructed that it won't start to fall apart. And what I mean by that is your layers have to seem different even though they're the same and you can only do that so much. This is a method that if you do the exact same question and, and same formula over and over and over, someone can pretty easily figure out what's going on. So we need to switch it up and we can't just keep going on it over and over and over. So what is that kind of limit, that threshold? In my opinion, that threshold max is four levels of equivocate. So four equivocate questions sort of in a row. Um, now it's better if you break those questions up and you do something in between, kind of extend it for longer periods of time, but um, you can get away with four. I would highly recommend sticking with three if you need to, but uh, you can't can extend it to four. Now what does this mean in terms of objects? For objects that you can force, like a total number of objects, so you give someone this number of objects and we're gonna force them down to one. What is that total number, that sweet spot? I'd say about 16 objects. You can do a 16 object equivocate down to one. And I am gonna show you guys how to do that in a, in a tutorial I have coming up soon that relies on equivocate. And it does use 16 cards. So it feels like you have a lot of choice, but the equivocate is only four levels deep. But again, I'll show you how to do that in that tutorial coming soon. So just to reiterate, I'd say no more than 16 objects. The less objects you have, the better the equivocate is gonna feel, but perhaps the strength of whatever effect would suffer. So you need to find that balance. I would never go more than 16, even that's pushing it. And then four levels, so that's four equivocate questions in a row. Again, I'd try to max it at three, but you can do four. So, time for an example. Now the basic form of equivocate, and that can be used for anything, is this sort of elimination plot. So let's say we wanna force the jack of hearts. Here's what you would do. Instead of saying choose a card, because if they choose a card and they choose the six, there's no way out of that. You said choose it, so this is the one they're gonna take. But if you say touch a card or take a card, watch how it changes. If you say take a card and they take the jack of hearts, perfect. You put the other one away and you have a miracle. You have exactly what you wanted. You don't have to do anything else. Okay, perfect, we'll use the jack of hearts. If they take the six of spades, then you can just say, okay, leave that on the table. And now we're left with the jack of hearts, okay? So you see how I just changed the plot depending on what they said. If they take the Jack of Hearts, I'll throw the Six of Spades away without thinking and I'll say, perfect, we'll use the Jack of Hearts. If they take the Six of Spades, I'll say, all right, throw that on the table. And now we're left with the Jack of Hearts. So I've eliminated the object if they take the one that I don't want them to take. Okay, and it's just about having a, a logical premise. The ways to make this feel logical and, and normal and like you're not doing anything sort of devious is to just, once they make their decision, know exactly what you're gonna say and just do it quickly. Make it seem like this is exactly what was supposed to happen. If they take this, then you say, all right, we're gonna use this one. And the reason it makes sense when you start hold it by holding them, if these objects are on the table, it's a different story. But if you're holding them and they take the six, right? That's the worst outcome if they take the one we don't want. And you say, put that on the table. And now that's out of their hands. And the only card between the two of you that you're holding is the jack now. So it makes sense now that, okay, we're gonna use the jack. It's in my hands, so that's the one we're gonna use. If they take the jack, it also makes perfect sense because it's in their hands, so it's the one they're gonna use. But that doesn't matter because we don't tell them before, we only tell them after they've made their decision, right? Another nice thing you can do with cards that I prefer is to do it with the backs facing them so they don't know. If they see the faces of the cards, they have a bit more of a sort of emotional attachment to the cards, right? Where it's like, I wanted the six of spades. They're gonna make that decision based on the card they want. Okay, so, so it's better to do it with the backs because then they're just picking at random. They're not as suspicious, right? If you say take one and they take the six and you say put that away and then you know they could say, well, I wanted the six, right? And, and you wanna avoid that. Now on the table, it, it plays a little differently. Imagine these two cards are on the table and you say push one towards me. If they push the jack towards you, the one we want them to take, again, it's perfect. It's the one they touched, so obviously it's the one we're gonna use. If they push the other one towards you, then it creates this nice moment where they've pushed this one towards you. So this one is now towards them. 
So you can say, so that's the one you want, right? Because now that one is, is right in front of them and they've pushed this one away like they don't want it. So I think this tends to even play out a little bit better if you can put the two objects on the table and have them sort of push them away, right? Because then you're, if it doesn't go out to plan and they push the wrong one, well, the card you want them to take is gonna be right next to them. So it makes sense to say, okay, so that's the one you want, right? The other one that they're like giving it to you, they're giving it to you to put away. The second they give it to me, I'm gonna take it and throw it in the middle of the deck because they don't want that one, right? One thing to avoid, right, as I was saying, is you never wanna say, choose one. It's always point at one, take one, push it towards me. It's never choose one. Choose one means whichever one they take, they're gonna want. You gotta be careful with take a card too. Um, that's a little bit riskier because that kind of is on the borderline of choose, but I'm gonna show you guys how you can really nicely use the take a card um, a, a method sort of in a sec. But the best is probably point, just point out one. And that goes really nicely with the push one forward on the table, right? So the elimination plot is essentially, if they pick the one you don't want, you say, all right, we'll get rid of it. And you pretend like that was the plan the whole time. You pretend like whichever one they pointed at, you were gonna get rid of the whole time. Okay, now I will be honest, I don't totally love it as just a simple, you know, if they point at this one, you say, all right, we'll get rid of it. It, it flies, it totally flies, but it feels a little off to me. So I'm gonna show you how to kind of change up the questions and, and use these questions in different ways um, and different methods of using equivocate. And it will still be sort of an elimination plot, but you never say the word eliminate. Eliminate to me is that kind of word that raises a little bit of suspicion. Why would we eliminate it if I touched it? So we're gonna phrase our questions differently so that we don't have to use the word eliminate. And you're gonna see how much better this plays out. Keep in mind, you can use these techniques I'm gonna give you for all kinds of objects. You're just gonna have to change the wording to match the objects you're using. So I'm gonna go over three really strong um, methods that I, I think you guys should know that particularly involve cards. We're gonna go over two 50-50 forces on how to force a color of a card, so black or red, and how to force a suit of a card, um, any suit you want, okay? And these two worked really well together because you start with the first uh, equivocate, you force the color, and then the suits are now narrowed down to two instead of four, and then you, again, you have that 50-50, okay? And the way you'll see, this is kind of a layered uh, equivocate. The questions are going to be totally different and they won't even raise any suspicion. So they work really well together to create a, a, basically a suit force at the end of the day. You probably wouldn't often just use the color force. There are some cases, but it's really those two to create a suit force. And then I'm going to show you my way to force any one of four objects. It's really strong, very logical. I've taken my time to create this uh, sort of phrasing. And you can use this for any objects. I obviously use it for cards a lot, but any objects you want, it'll work perfectly. So let's start with the suit and the color force. Now I got to give some credit. This is essentially a method for forcing color and suit that I saw Alex Pandrea do. Not sure if it's original to him, specifically the suit part, because it's really cool how he does it. It's very unique, um, but I really loved it. So I took it and I just adapted a little bit of the answers. I think the questioning that I give is, is still the same, but the answers, I think make it feel a little bit more logical, especially if they do the worst case scenario. So this color and suit force are gonna be examples of totally verbal forces, which is amazing because we don't even need a deck of cards to force a suit onto someone. We're just, it's just based on what they say. It's essentially name a suit and they're always gonna say the suit we want. It's not quite that clean, but it'll feel that clean to your spectators, okay? So the color force, this is a classic color force that is used by numerous magicians all the time. So here's what you say. You say, I have an invisible deck of cards here. And in this deck, there are two colors. What are they? they'll respond the blacks and the reds. If not, you can just say the blacks and the reds, I like to ask. And then you say, imagine I take out one color from the box, which one do I take? And then they answer. Now this is the open-ended question. Let's say we wanna force black. If they say black, it's perfect, it makes sense. We dump out the cards, they're in our hands, we take the black ones. So obviously if we took the black ones, they're the ones we're gonna use. They're the ones we've dumped out of the box. They're the ones I invisibly have in my hand. So they're the ones we're gonna use, right? It totally makes sense. Now, if they say red, this is totally fine because think of it. We dumped the cards 
out from the box. So now what are we left with in the box? We're left with the black cards. So you just need to make it seem like that's what we were going for the whole time. So what I usually say is if they say red, I'll say perfect. So now we have the blacks left in the box. I dump those out into my hand and I just say that straight. I don't pause, nothing like that. Because if I just say, now we're left with the blacks. Yeah, but I named red. Like you see, it's weird there. But if you say, all right, so we're left with the blacks. Now I dump those out into my hands and I spread them. It doesn't give them a chance to question anything, but it also makes perfect sense. We dump the reds out. Now we have these left in the box. So I dump the rest out into my hands. And those are the ones we're gonna use because those are the ones we wanted, right? So I eliminated the cards they said, but it didn't feel like that. Now this color force, Again, it, it applies to cards because it's the idea of an invisible card box, but you could easily change that to something else, okay? Now this color force is where the real genius is, I think, um, because it's a real nice verbal force. You don't have to deal with much of the elimination at all, and it's a cool, unique idea, and it doesn't feel anything like that first part that we just did. So you're not gonna now say, oh, I have the, har the uh, spades and the clubs. I dump those out of the box, but like it's nothing to do with that. It's totally different, so it won't raise any suspicion. Because if you did the box thing again with the spades and the clubs, if they pick the one, the opposite of what they did the first time, and you do something different, it doesn't doesn't make any sense, right? So here, here's what I do. So we're at the point where I've said, I spread those cards in my hand to say something like this. All right, so I have those black cards spread in my hand and we have two suits. You can see the spades and the clubs. I want you to keep saying those over and over in your head. Just keep switching. Spades, clubs, spades, clubs, spades, clubs. Just keep switching like that. And now they're gonna be switching between the two objects in their head. And that's all you need them to be doing is doing that switch, okay? And then you just say, when I say stop, you're gonna stop, but don't say out loud which one you're at, okay? Simple as that. What I really like to do is have someone else say stop if I have another spectator. It's just another thing that feels like another free choice, makes it a little bit better. So I'll say, all right, when he says stop, I just want you to stop on whatever one you're at, but don't say it out loud, okay? So they do this, they stop. Let's say we're trying to force spades. In this case, the best case scenario is if they stop on clubs in their head, and you'll see why. So this person calls stop, let's say they stopped on clubs. Now you say, if you were to switch one more time, what would it be? And you might think this is weird, but it's not. Because they never said it out loud, and it was a random time that they stopped, that doesn't help us figure it out, that doesn't do anything. It's just one more little change, but this is gonna set us up for something really nice. So you say, change one more time, what would it be? So they're at clubs, now they're gonna change to spades, and they're gonna say it out loud, they're gonna say spades. Perfect, you have your hit, you're done, you move on, you've just forced spades. If they say clubs, this is where my handling and, and some of my uh, verbiage uh, I'm gonna show you guys that I think is really nice. If they stopped on spades, you say switch one more time and they switch to clubs and you say, okay, so you were originally thinking of spades. That's a good choice. Do you want to stick with that? So this is a mentalism principle where you are confirming something. You're, you're trying to make them feel like they made the right choice and people are a lot more likely to say yes, right? So if I said, oh, you pick spades, that's a bad choice. I don't know why you would go with that people are gonna wanna switch. But if I say that's a good choice, you should stick with your instincts. People wanna stick with what they thought, right? If you, if they made a decision, their original decision was to stop on spades and you made them change one more time to clubs, but they were originally on spades. So they're gonna kinda already want to be like, well, I was on spades originally. Like, why are you making me switch? So we're gonna feed into that. The second they say clubs, which is not what we want, we're just gonna say, Oh, so you were on spades. Spades is a good choice. Is that the one you want to go with? And the combination of that you saying, so you chose spades, that's a good one. We're doing this positive reinforcement. Do you want to stick with it? 99% of the time they're going to say yes and we're good to go. We're really good to go. It's perfect. Now, what if they do say no? So as you can see, as we're going through this, we're starting to dive into the worst case scenarios. But even with the worst case scenario, it's still gonna be logical and make sense. So let's reiterate where we are. They stopped on spades, we're trying to force spades. We said switch one more time. They switch and they say clubs. We say, oh, so you were on spades, that's a good one. Do you wanna stick with that? And they say no. All you respond with is, okay, so we'll take away the clubs. Now we've just started to introduce that taking away, that elimination idea, because we never said if we were eliminating or keeping at the beginning of this, right? We say, if you want to stick with spades, that's a good one. And they say, no, they've just implied they want to go with clubs. So we'll just say, okay, so you, you want to take away the clubs. Be careful you don't say get rid of or eliminate here. And I'll show you why. You want to take away the clubs. 
they're gonna say yes because they just said they didn't want the spades. Now we take away the clubs and again, we're left with the spades and I like to tie that back into, okay, I have the spades in my hand from the, the color force, right? Where I spread the cards in my hand, now I have the spades left in my hand. Now you're probably asking, well, what if they say no again? You wanna stick with spades? They say no. Okay, so we'll take away the clubs. No, never happened to me before. But all you would need to do is say, okay, so then you want the spades, right? It, like maybe they made a little mistake in their head and they, you know, whatever, they got confused. You say, okay, so you do want the spades. Simple as that, you just say, we'll take away the clubs. So now you just say, so you want the spades, we'll take the spades. I like to say, so we'll take the spades because I said, take away the clubs. Now I just changed the wording to take the spades, right? When they say yes to that, now I've taken the spades, taken them in my hand. So it makes perfect sense. Again, that's probably, that's way too far. You're never gonna get to that point. But just if you did, you can see how easy this is to control the narrative. So that is the suit force. I use this all the time. It's amazing. And the way I've adapted it and, and the way uh, Pandrea did it, it's just fantastic all combined together with that sort of verbiage. So play around with that. Just go through this again, watch the, the wordings I use, maybe write it down so you have all your different outs. But it's really, really nice. Maybe I'll uh, post something below with my scripting written out for this uh, color force. I think I'll do that. I'll leave a little document for you guys to check out. All right, so now we'll get into something really interesting, the four object force. Now again, I'm gonna demonstrate this with playing cards, but this works with any objects. Just like the switching in your head force will work with any objects. Now this obviously will need the physical objects here. So here's, here's what you're gonna do. You could divide this into your 50-50. You have two piles and you just say, pick a pile, they pick one, then you go 50-50 again, and they, they pick one like that. So in this, we'll try to force the jack of hearts, which I'll leave right there. I'll, I'll leave it face up, I guess. So here are some of the questions you can say when you have physical objects, right? You can say, point at one. If they point at the one you want, you take it. If they point at the one you don't want, you just get rid of it. It's as simple as that. And you say, all right, now we're left with these. Remember, you want to go quickly into things. You don't want to have them point at this one and you go, and you just wait, right? You want to go push it away and say, all right, point at another, right? We're just, we're moving. We're not giving them time to think about what just happened. One of my favorites is you can say, push one towards me, right? So let's imagine they're here and they push this one towards me. Say, okay, so those are the ones you want, right? They're right next to them, assuming they're across to me. So it makes sense. And then another thing you can say is, take one for you and one for me. Right? So if they take this pile for them and this to me, then you say, okay, so you want that pile. If they do the opposite, then you say, okay, so we'll use these ones. Cause these are the ones you gave to me. I'm the magician, so we're gonna use these, all right? So those are like three different kind of methods you can use in equivocate briefly. Um, you gotta be careful how you layer these. Here's the problem, right? If you did a point and they point and you keep the one they pointed at, and then you say point again, they point at this one and then you eliminate it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So you don't want to put those back to back. So that's why there's a few different pushings and pointings that you can combine to make it seem not so obvious. But here's a perfect four object force in my opinion. Now I've covered this force in my Die Vernon back in time sort of trick in the equivocate portion, but I'm gonna cover it again because it's really nice and it works with any four objects. So what we're gonna say is take one, right? Right now we have a 25% chance of getting them to take that Jack of Hearts. And if they take it, there's nothing more fair than this. Okay, and that's it, that's so easy, right? If they take the one we want, obviously. If they don't, we haven't said anything yet. So we'll just say, okay, put that one down. Let's get rid of that one, okay? And right now, we've just eliminated a card. So in their mind, the ones they're touching, we're eliminating, okay? And this is the most likely case that they're gonna point out, they're gonna take one that we aren't forcing, right? That's 75% chance that they're gonna do that. So now in their head, anything they point out, we're eliminating. You need to keep that in mind. So now, I just say point at two. If they point at these two, it makes perfect sense. The ones they touch we're eliminating and we're left with one. Perfect sense. But again, most likely they'll point at one with the jack. But here's why it works. The last time we said take a card and the one they took we discarded. This time since we say point, if they point at these two and we just throw this down right away, it was different than last time. They didn't take the one they only pointed, and because they pointed, they won't think about this, but if they were to, they could think, oh, I took the one we eliminated and now I'm pointing at the ones we're keeping. It's not perfectly clear to them what's going on, but so far there's nothing too fishy, okay? And now we're left with two. And again, all you need to do is say, take one. 
And here's what's really sneaky about a layered equivocate. We did a take one when we had four cards and we eliminated it. Now that we have two, we might keep it, we might eliminate it. But here's what's beautiful. If they take our force card, if we're following the plot, we should eliminate it, right? Because we've been eliminating everything they've taken. So if they take this one, like the first time, we should eliminate it. But because it's the final two, if they take it, we just counter with, so that's the one you want. People always say yes. If they take it, it's the one they want. Because there's two objects left, when they take that object, it's signifying this is the one they want, right? Because it's the last of the objects. So we're, it's totally fair that they take that object and we say, okay, so that's the one we'll use. That's the one you want. And we can throw the other one away. You see, you see how that works with two objects? When you're down to your final two, you can repeat a question. Like you can repeat the point. If they point at this one, yeah, last time we discarded the pointing one, but now they're signifying this is the last choice. This is the one they want. You see how it fits when there's two left? And again, if they choose this one, it fits the plot. If they, they take this one, it fits the plot, we get rid of it, right? That, that's what we've been doing this whole time. So let's go through uh, a best case scenario quick and a worst case scenario. So best case scenario, take any card. If they take the jack, we're done. Worst case scenario, take any card. All right, drop that over there. Point at two. These two, all right, we'll use these. Take one. All right, get rid of that and we're left with one. This is especially powerful if you're holding these objects because you have this nice moment, especially at the end, um, where they say take one, you say drop it on the table. Point at two, let's say these two, you drop it on the table, then you say take one. They take the one we don't want, so again, worst case scenario, you just say, all right, drop it on the table. And now you're left, you're holding the last one, so obviously this is the one we're gonna use. So you can see how this plot no matter which sort of avenue they go down, makes sense and they won't question it. So how to build your own equivocate. Obviously, I said you can do this with a lot more than just cards. I've given you several tips and methods in here that you guys can use. Pointing, touching, taking, giving one to you, one to me. There's all these methods that you're gonna have to use to layer your equivocate, okay? It's important that we don't repeat any questions in our layering, unless it's the last two. You can get away with a repeat because of the reason that if they do the opposite, of what they did the first time, it won't seem suspicious because it's the last two. This is their final choice. You, you know what I'm saying there? If you have a lot of objects, right? If we have eight objects, instead of starting with the take one, we don't want to start with that. It doesn't make sense. We're going to group those into groups of four. Okay, and then we'll say point at a pile. Now they point at a pile and we can use equivocate. So again, it's just limiting our their choices down to 50-50. I know in the four object one, I didn't do that at the beginning, but that's because I've developed a really nice sort of way of, of intertwining that. But most of the time you wanna just keep changing the options to 50-50, right? So if you have eight objects, you go four and four, they pick one pile and you go two and two, they pick one pile and then they got two objects left and you can get your force object. Again, you'd wanna use different. You wanna to do touch one, take one, uh, push one to you, one to me. So these different questions are important. The biggest thing that I urge you to do is work through the best, the medium and the worst case scenario and make sure that every outcome has a logical conclusion. Remember, logical question to a logical answer with a logical conclusion. Okay, so you need to make sure that whatever they say, you have a logical reason that doesn't raise any red flags and doesn't contradict anything that you've said or done in the past. So make sure you test out all your outcomes and you have it all memorized, you know what to do. Use creative plots. As you can see, the dumping the cards out of the card box totally gets rid of the sense that we're eliminating. You can use all kinds of cool plots, right? If I wanted to force two shoes, for example, like I gave you like a, some Jordans or some Yeezys, right? I'd say, all right, I want you to imagine you have a, a box of shoes, right? And it's a brand new box, you just bought it, okay? And now you open up the shoe box and there's two shoes and they don't match. And you take one of those out. Which one do you take out? And if I'm trying to force the Jordans, if they say the Yeezys, I say, okay, so you've left the Jordans in the box. So those are the ones you're gonna take home with you or something like that. Right? And if they take out the Jordans, then it's perfect. You put the Jordans on, you lace them up, we're good to go. So you can see how it's just about developing logical plots, logical conclusions. Definitely feel free, if you're using four objects, use that template I've given you, test it out. You can see how well it'll work with all of the outcomes. And that suit force and that color force, absolutely fantastic. Um, one of my favorite 
things in magic, like just being able to verbally force a suit on someone, way more helpful than you'd believe. Um, I have one trick that you guys are probably really interested in. I've been working uh, a little bit lately on some mentalism, uh, playing card divinations. So the dream effect is to have someone freely think of a playing card and you know exactly what it is. No gimmicks, no nothing, just by your words. You're not, no props, totally propless. And I'm getting really close. Uh, I, ha I have a way to narrow it down to a couple of cards. That's pretty, pretty cool using a lot of Peter Turner stuff. But for now, in the meantime, I have one trick that I perform all the time that's really fantastic where we take a card out of the deck, one card, no gimmicks, nothing, and I hand it to someone, they hold it, and we go through the room as a group, and we name the value, the color, the suit, and it matches, okay? That is one of my favorite tricks, one of the absolute strongest effects. One day I will be teaching that because I put a lot of subtleties and a lot of work into that, and it's really strong, and it does work always. Um, and for the suit and the color force, I do use equivocate. Obviously the value is a lot more difficult and you can't really use equivocate, but that's where all the real cool psychology comes in. But the equivocate just plays so well, everyone totally feels like it's a free choice. So that's just an example of how powerful this can be. So I think that's about it. Um, I have a really cool effect coming up for you guys. One of my originals I call double determination. Uh, super neat, uh, really fun effect. One of my first creations and one that is uh, still in my repertoire and gets amazing reactions. It does use the suit force. So practice that because you guys are gonna love this trick. But I wanna thank you guys for watching and thank you for the support. It really means so much. I know we're up in the 430 subscribers, which is crazy. Uh, uh, you know, 500 subs is coming soon. Then a thousand, I have some uh, crazy tutorials that I wanna share with you guys. I'm thinking I have, I'm gonna teach one of my favorites, one that you guys have probably seen me perform a lot, um, called Mental Image. It's a mentalism effect, but it I say any playing card magicians should do it too, because it's just absolutely amazing, original effect of mine where it's essentially a playing card divination. It's not as clean as the dream effect, but it's such a fair feeling thought of card effect where they literally think of a card and you know what it is, it works 100% of the time and it gets some amazing reactions. One of my newer creations and I would love to share that with you guys. So I'm thinking 500, 750, 1000 subs. One of those, I will teach that trick. Um, let me know if you guys want to learn it. Uh, you can see performances on my channel. And then at a thousand, I'm thinking a thousand, I'll probably do a fun little giveaway or something like that. And uh, just, you know, thank you guys. Thank you everyone that's here. Thank you to everyone that's new and who will be here. And uh, I really appreciate it. So with all that said, drop a comment. Um, the comments mean a lot to me. I love reading the comments and I, I love engaging with everyone, but uh, drop a like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.